coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, Internet Explorer, Ruby on Rails, and the NVIDIA driver for Windows all have new exploits this week. We'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Plus, picking the right VPS provider, your questions, our answers, and Alan's EuroBSDCon videos. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. everyone, and welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. This is episode 91, and we streamed it live on January 3rd, 2013. My name is Chris, and this episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com, and we'll tell you a little bit more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by ScaleEngine.com, but none of that compares to our host, Mr. Alan Jude, the admin, the tech, and the teacher. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. How's it going? Pretty good. Now we have, guess what? Big show. Huge, huge feedback segment today. Like, yes. I, I had to cut it off at like around nine emails, and we kind of we'll, we kind of spread them out around the show a little bit too to kind of even things out. Uh, but, but we still want more emails. Send we, more emails. Well, we kind of went through our inventory now. So yeah, email us your tech questions. Anything that's like sysadmin related, or maybe you're trying to build out some infrastructure and you're stuck on something. Take advantage of our years of IT experience. Email us techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or start a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Or even better, use the contact link at the top of Jupiter Broadcasting. Just hit that contact link and then uh, choose the techsnap in the drop down. Alan. We should probably get to some of these exploits. I mean, I'm looking at the list. I, I, I sent out a tweet before the show started because we're live at Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. Or wait, what? No, no. no. 4 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, 4 p.m. Eastern over at JBLive.tv. And I always tweet out before we start. Uh, and I noon Eastern know. is usually about when I start writing the show. <laughs> noon Eastern is uh, when we do Coda Radio, so I don't know why I got that mixed uh. up. Uh, but I, I was looking, I was going down the list, and I'm like, geez, an IE vulnerability, a freaking Ruby on Rails vulnerability, and video vulnerability, just like going down the list of all these vulnerabilities, Alan. So why don't we jump into it and start? Uh, with yeah, well, say, the worst part is, you know, when this stuff happens right around Christmas time when everybody's busy, you know, sysadmins are on vacation or whatever, and, you know, stuff maybe doesn't get patched as quickly as it normally would. Right, right. Yes. Because I, I remember, was it last year, like Christmas Eve, I think it was, FreeBSD came out with a, a big list of. Uh, vulnerabilities having to do with uh, <laughs> DNS, I think. I remember that, else. yeah, yeah. And it was just, and you know, it, it, it starts off with an apology. It's like, we apologize that this is happening right at Christmas, but this is <laughs> important, so that. it has to happen. They literally did apologize, too. Yes, well, Colin was a and, good guy. And then you've had Microsoft do the opposite in December, where they've actually delayed their patches to try not to conflict with the holiday schedule, and it ended up like pushing out like a vulnerable patch that needed to get out there. Yeah. Uh, kind of like this one, this first one we have today is an IE vulnerability that uh, affects... Yes. Like quite a like uh, at least the latest versions of IE is it? I don't know but about not the older the latest versions, versions actually. Oh, so, okay. Uh, this exploit affects Internet Explorer six, seven, and eight, but not nine and ten. Okay. The biggest issue here is that if you're running Windows XP or I think Server two thousand three and maybe even two thousand eight, uh, you can't upgrade past IE eight. So right. you're still vulnerable. Right. Right. Uh, only like. Vista and newer can get newer versions of Internet Explorer. Uh, so that means XP users were cut off and stuck with just 8, and Microsoft maybe hasn't been great about patching 8. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a number of large organizations are still using Windows XP, and there's a lot of home users that are still using Windows XP. Uh, and because of that, they're running, they can't be running anything newer than Windows Ex or Internet Explorer 8. And so they're vulnerable in this case. Yeah, uh, I just read, actually, to, to your point, Alan, I just read that just recently, Windows 7 has surpassed XP in deployment, but even that's kind of questioned because of the way they measure it. I can yep. tell you from my personal client base, traveling around to my clients, uh, there's just simply users that actually prefer to use XP. And, and yep. I actually have users who have requested not to have PC upgrades so they can keep XP. So you're, I, I, mean, I kept with XP until I needed 64-bit because I wanted more RAM. Well, you know, and what I do That was I the do only for, thing that pushed me from... Up uh, from XP, and it's not. It's this is not an option for everybody because a lot of times there's web apps that require IE. But in every circumstance, I can anybody that's on XP, I move them over to Chrome or Firefox. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't used Internet Explorer since Windows ninety eight. <laughs> yeah, you know some sites require it. Still. Yes, but I I mostly try to kill them. <laughs> yeah, you, you ignore those sites. Yeah, you, yes. yeah, burn them with fire. Uh, well, I remember uh, the interface for one of my switches didn't work with older versions of Firefox, but it works fine now. Oh, that's a so great Firefox example, Firefox yeah. has changed something to, to make it work, and that's made me very happy because, yeah. you know. Yeah. 
avoiding yeah. using Internet Explorer. Like, do you remember back in the day when like you would have Java, Microsoft Java, and so some things would only work with Microsoft Java, and then some things would only work with Sun Java. And there was a period of time where like I had switches that used the Microsoft Java in IE. And so I could only use Microsoft Java and Internet Explorer to manage those switches. It was a nightmare. Yep. So what's uh, so is the patch out for these IE uh, vulnerabilities? Ah, no. Uh, so uh, specifically, this exploit was used in what's called a water hole or watering hole attack. <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, that's when uh, you take over a website, a, a popular website, and, and put a vulner- uh, exploit on it, specifically because you want to infect the people that are going to go to this website on a regular basis. Right, like we talked uh, before, remember there was a website, it was like a news site about the aerospace industry? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So they would put an exploit there trying to infect people that, uh, with this fake message about an aerospace conference. Uh, well, in this case, they're trying to target people that uh, would visit the website of a think tank called the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a fairly big think tank, and this board of directors includes like Madeleine Albright and Colin Powell. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, so they uh, compromised the website for the Council on Foreign Relations and put this Internet Explorer vulnerability on it. So people who uh, went to this website using Internet Explorer, maybe because they worked at a, in a government or something where they didn't have a choice to run anything except Internet Explorer, uh, could have ended up being infected by this. Huh. Even after being used in such a high-profile attack, uh, although there was actually other attacks using this exploit as well, including one against uh, an energy company, uh, but even after such high-profile attacks, Microsoft announced that a patch for the exploit uh, wasn't going to be ready for Tuesday this week. Uh, So the patch Tuesday or whatever, the, the latest round of patches that just came out for Microsoft for this month don't include an update for this vulnerability. So there's a temporary fix, it looks like. Right. So Microsoft has uh, issued a temporary fix-it solution, which is uh, this little app you download and it does something. Yeah. Uh, Basically, they're not supported the same way that uh, the patches are. Yeah. They're kind of, uh, if you really need to solve this and can't wait for the patch, then use this. I think they might even, I know they they might not, but it gets pretty close to the term use at your own risk uh, on this site. Basically, yes. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Uh, so I have a link to it there if you want, if you need it. Uh, but yeah, it mitigates the exploit until Microsoft can release a proper patch, uh, which likely comes down to some testing. And, and it'll be interesting to see if this comes out as an like an out of band high priority update, or if they wait until next month's uh, Patch Tuesday or whatever. Oh yeah, I think because of the criticality of this, hopefully it comes out as an out of band update very soon. But maybe, and I, I don't know if Microsoft would do this, but if you're Microsoft and you're trying to get people, I mean, Microsoft legitimately wants to get people off yes, their old versions. Yes, but if people are use, if like if you're an organization still using XP, it's probably not necessarily because you want to still be using no, XP. No, I totally agree. But Microsoft, so maybe Microsoft feels force- it can apply a little bit of pressure here, just a little uncomfort to get yeah, people to think about it a little more. And people, then, that that w- <laughs> people that are still using XP at home aren't the type of people well, that yeah, are going to understand yeah. any of this and actually... You're right, you're right. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's that why character. they would never do it. So I'm, I'm sure. sure Microsoft would might think that, but it's not, how, it's not reality. Yeah. So. yeah, they have a responsibility to end users. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, although technically I think Internet, uh, Windows XP is actually pretty much out of its like, even extended support now. And, you know... Oh, I should People know that. really need to upgrade. I thought it was like in July, but I don't know. Yeah, they, they extended it a couple of times. Uh, yeah, okay. It's like the longest supported version of Windows ever. But Yeah, right, right. Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> like, uh, it's funny. You know, in the live chat room, uh, we're, I'm kind of following along the conversation, and Project Morris says, we still have Windows 2000 users in our company. And, you know, I, I've, I've walked into my clients where they have Windows 2000 on the server. I don't... I don't think I've seen any Windows 2000 except for maybe like on a like a proprietary call screening type box or, or something like that in a long time. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, interesting. Any other thoughts on that story, Alan? Uh, no, that's about it. You know, every now and then <laughs> when we do these IE stories, we actually get feedback in the comments section or something like that where somebody says, I actually just, I use IE because I prefer it. They're out there. They're out there. They're out there. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's talk yeah, we, about... We, uh, Oh, go ahead. They, they make these, like, inflatable hammers for hitting people. Oh, jeez. Uh, some people are going to get hit over the head with this one. Rail, uh, Ruby on uh, Rails. This one's not that bad, actually. But uh, it's, extre- yeah. I mean, it's like almost as widely deployed as almost any web technology. Right, it's not that there. exploitable, though. Is what oh, I mean. okay. So tell me the details. 
Uh, so there's a vulnerability that was announced in all versions of Ruby on Rails, which is a framework for the Ruby programming languages for making web apps. Uh, but basically, it was kind of used as a, a bit more of a scare tactic than it maybe actually is. Okay. So it's a serious flaw, although it's not that easy to exploit. And the known conditions for being able to exploit it right now come down to a uh, misconfiguration that is going to cause you just as many other problems as it is this SQL injection. Okay. But so anyway. it comes down to malpractice again. Kind of. Uh, so a flaw in an implementation of the finder method in the active record system. So <laughs> active record is a system in a couple of different um, frameworks like Code Igniter for PHP and Ruby on Rails for uh, Ruby that allows you to access your SQL in such a way that it does all the SQL injection protection for you, right? Uh, so it allows you also like you select an active record, so you do a query and you select a certain record, but then you can like do an update to it without having to write the whole SQL yourself. Anyway, okay, okay. Uh, so in this case, it allows you, uh, there's these automatic methods called find by that get created for every model. So you have like a user object and you say user dot find by last name and then enter a last name and it will query the database and find all the users based on that key. Uh, and it allows you to do those from your regular like uh, URL parameters, right? Uh, anyway, it's possible that someone could inject arbitrary SQL using this method. Okay. Uh, but not f as trivially as, as it might sound. Um, if you use, if you just do SQL injection with the URL parameters. Uh, they end up coming into Ruby as a string instead of what Ruby calls a, um, I forget what it's called now, <laughs> uh, special object reference thing. Uh, then it, it's not exploitable. Uh, right? Because the keys are always strings instead of um, objects. Anyway, so there's a very popular uh, library called AuthLogic that handles authentication for your application and in some specific instances it can be vulnerable to this SQL injection uh, not through a uh, modifying the URL but actually through modifying a cookie hmm. so uh, the way the cookies work is uh, the authentication information is stored on uh, as a cookie on the user's computer and normally, you know, you'd have a problem where there where the user could modify their cookie, right? Uh, so to prevent that, the cookies are cryptographically signed with an HMAC signature based on a secret key. Uh, the problem comes uh, in that specifically in open source applications or as, uh, when people copy stuff off GitHub, the key might be publicly known. Right, like uh, in an open source application, a lot of times they'll have a key set, and if you don't change that to different for your install of that application, mm -hmm. then anybody else using this that application or anyone who can see it on GitHub or whatever will know what your HMAC key is. So then they can modify their cookie, and then resign it so that your app will think it's valid, and then will load instead of strings, it will load the actual object. Hmm. And that would allow them to inject SQL into the Ruby on Rails system through Active Record, which is supposed to protect you from SQL injections. Uh. <laughs> so it's a very, very specific case. So it's not that Ruby on Rails forgets to uh, escape something or that you know there's something wrong with it. It's just there's a, basically a second parameter to the find by that allows you to inject arbitrary SQL for when you need to. And you're supposed to, when you're writing that part of the code, you're doing that on stuff that's not user provided so that it's not vulnerable to SQL injection. Uh, however, in one specific case, by modifying a cookie, a user could cause their input to be an object instead of a string and be interpreted as that second parameter instead of as the, uh, the string it's supposed to be. Uh, anyway, so there's a, a CVE about it, and uh, I have a link to an article that explains it in a little more detail and has the word I can't remember. 
in Ruby, there's special things that start with a colon and then a name. It's it's not a constant, but it's different than a, it's like a special kind of variable or something. It's like a key. I forget what the name. Anyway, uh, so Ruby on Rails has released new versions of the framework: uh, 3.2.10, 3.1.9, and 3.0.18. So whichever of those three branches you're using, you upgrade to the latest version, and it fixes the problem. Very nice. Uh, so. It doesn't mean that every app running an older version of Ruby is vulnerable, okay. but they recommend everybody upgrade anyway. All right. So there you go, folks. And Alan has links to additional coverage like over at ThreatPost in the show yes. notes as well. Yes, ThreatPost always has good coverage on this type of stuff. Speaking of things special, Alan, we had a very special offer from GoDaddy, our longtime sponsor of the TechSnap program. And it was the uh, very, very good discount, the uh, Tech 295 promo, which was set to expire at the end of December where you could get a .com for you know, two dollars and ninety-five cents. Tech two ninety-five. Well, GoDaddy is expand ex- extending that to the end of January for us. So when you're checking out over at GoDaddy.com, if you want to get a .com, and I'm talking the full-fledged .com, up to three of those bad boys for two dollars and ninety-five cents, use the code Tech two ninety-five when you check out at GoDaddy.com. Just go right there. You put in, you put anything in there you want to. Boom, you'd get it. Now we've heard from some of you say that doesn't work in the U.S. and we apologize about that. Now we do have a code that I believe works yeah, everywhere. Outside the U.S. Because obviously it would work in the U.S. Oh, oh, yeah. Did I? See? Yeah, in, yeah. I'm an outside. And it worked US, in so. Canada. Oh, but really? I, yeah. Uh, specifically, I think it has something to do with uh, they have like a new payment processor or something that this deal is aimed at. Oh. Because I wasn't able to use PayPal to pay. I had to use my credit card there you when go. I bought. Uh, I heard so that it may too. have something to do with that yeah. as well. So, uh, so FYI on that. Yeah, th- there are other codes that work. Uh, as well, yeah. Uh, like was it like TechSnap ten and TechSnap? Uh, well, and, and we still have. Uh, we'll have it for a little while now. The Go twenty off five. Now this actually is a, is really great because then it's just twenty percent off any order you're doing. So if you're doing renewals, which I have to do, uh, if you're doing like any kind of other things that are outside of like a dot com purchase, I mean your best savings if you're getting a dot com is going to be Tech two ninety five. But if you're going to yeah. do something else, use Go twenty off five when you're checking out. You get it for twenty percent off. Like yes. I'll and give you an example. One, that one even works on renewals, right? Yep, I think yep, so. Yep, like I just Which bought a domain. Which is always the best place to have a coupon code for. I just bought dot, a dot .tv domain. Obviously, I can't mm-hmm. use Tech 295 for that. So I use Go20 off 5. I still save 20% off the cost. And you know what the domain was? You ready for this? JBGame.tv. Ooh. JBGame.tv. If you go to that, it'll take you to our new Google Plus gaming community that Price TX is setting up. I'm sure he'll be probably be talking to you, nice. Alan. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> we have uh, over there. We have you know right now we have a Minecraft server for Jupiter Broadcasting audience members. We have a, Z- a Zonotic yep. server Zonotic. over there. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he's thinking about uh, you know getting uh, the pulse of the audience and seeing what folks want. So he's looking yep. for suggestions, and the Google Plus page is going to be used for that. He's also using that to schedule gaming events in the audience. Like he has a yes, Zonotic, uh, scheduled uh, events are are always fun. Uh, yeah. You know that uh, Jupiter Force had one recently. Yeah, for Stowe. Yeah, yeah. So he's doing one for Zonotic this Saturday. Ooh. And so people can go over to jbgame.tv. It'll forward them to the Google Plus community, and you can join that if you want to play with other gamers. I mean. <laughs> You know, he was talking, and he said, Chris, with Steam coming to Linux, you know, there's going to be a lot more people playing games that watch yeah. broadcasting shows. There's a lot of really great indie games out there that people can kind of, you know, just yes, talk about. Uh, I should go over there and schedule a night of DEF CON. Ooh, I want to do, have you, have, Artemis, have you heard awesome, of this bridge awesome commander game where everybody plays a role on the, on, the, on the bridge of the Enterprise? Have you heard of this game? Ooh. Uh, it's not called Bridge Commander because the game no, called no. Bridge Commander is different. No, it's like Ar- it's like Armidus or something. Uh, I want to play that so bad. Yeah. So that, that, that sounds was- like what Bridge Commander should have been. Right. So like you could one person's the con, one person's a navigator, one person's weapons, one person's engineering. I played a game like that for, but with submarines. It was oh, good. that'd be cool too. That'd be it's cool on, it's, too. It's also on Steam. It's called Dangerous Waters. Oh, uh, oh, there you go. So it's somebody uh, who has that in the chat room. Uh, it's AJS. Artemis. Artemis has it there. Yeah, it's Artemis. Uh, AJS124. Thank you. Anyways, I digress. So I used the Go20 off 5 when I got that because it was a .tv. So thank you to GoDaddy.com for their long-time sponsorship of the TechSnap program. And thank you to everybody who supports them. Visit those links in our show notes just to let them know that you are appreciative of them sponsoring us. And uh, go use Go20 off 5 to save 20% or Tech295 to get that .com for $2.95. Yep. All right, Alan, now we've got another news story. About uh, this one might actually affect uh, some of the people watching right now. Yes. Right? Tell uh, me about so it. there was a zero day exploit for the NVIDIA display drivers on Windows. Dun dun dun. Uh, specifically, there's a part of the NVIDIA display driver is a service that listens on a named pipe called NSVR, right, for NVIDIA server, uh, that basically has a, a, a null access control list, meaning it's not restricted. Uh, 
So any user logged onto the machine or any remote user in a domain context. Yeah. Uh, so it means if the machine is joined to a domain. Yeah. Uh, specifically for the domain, remote access via domain context is only if the user has file sharing enabled and has the firewall rules relaxed or disabled, uh, could have access to use this uh, named pipe. Huh. Uh, from that, the attacker could then trigger a stack buffer overflow <laughs> due to uh, a memmove operation that could allow them to uh, specify the location and the amount of memory that they want to move. Uh, that exploit could be used uh, to get privilege escalation and basically gain full control over the machine, right? getting administrator access. And uh, I don't have all the details, but apparently the exploit is able to somehow bypass the data execution prevention and address space layout randomization feature that was introduced in Windows Vista. Whoa, you're kidding me. I mean, those are supposed to be sort of like a Microsoft... The protection against these specific types yes. of exploits. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, the details on that or if that has something to do with the fact that NVIDIA maybe disables DEP or ASLR on specifically on their graphics drivers. I don't think so, but if you remember back a couple of months ago, we talked about how... Um, was it the ATI drivers had issues with ASLR? Do you remember that was? I do. Yes, that's right. A couple right. of months ago, but it must be the way these drivers. I, I I'm not they entirely changed, sure. I thought they changed the I'm way these. I'm pretty sure ATI fixed that issue. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure, uh, and you know, the I, I, th I was under the impression that Nvidia didn't have that issue, hmm. uh, but I'm not. Uh, but in this case, it, it may be. Well, the problem with the um, the ATI one was that enabling it machine wide. Broke uh, meant you just blue screened all the time, uh, whereas obviously that didn't happen with the NVIDIA ones. But it, it may seem that the NVIDIA uh, does something uh, around ASLR with their drivers. Shoot, I don't. You'll you'll have to read the story to get more information. Uh, I didn't have that much time to go that in depth in it. Uh, but there was an exploit for this that was originally made public. Yeah, uh, because the researcher felt that the risk was fairly minimal since it could only be remotely exploited if. You were in a domain context but had no firewall and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, the exploit has been taken down, uh, either possibly from pressure from the community or because someone pointed out an additional w uh, attack vector that could mean this exploit could be more widely used. Yeah, I got the feeling he was contacted. Uh, excuse me, uh, son. Well, uh, he, w he was talking about how normally he would have done responsible disclosure and, you know, told NVIDIA about it, give him time to make a patch, and so on, and then announce. Yeah. But he decided that it wasn't that important, so he could just announce it, which seems like... It's like if you're, if you're for responsible disclosure, you do responsible disclosure. You Regardless. don't decide right. randomly that you're going to do full disclosure right. all of a sudden. That's like um, I come out and say I'm against drinking, and then I go home and I have a beer. I mean, it's like one of those things where you, it's, it's almost like you say, it, you say something outwardly just to save face, and then in reality you practice yeah. something differently. Because, yeah, you don't just selectively do random uh, responsible disclosure. I, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. No. Anyway. Um, Anyways. What so are you going to do? It's out there. going to see a new moving. version of the NVIDIA driver soon that solves this issue. The problem is, uh, is uh, people made a copy of while it was out. I mean, it, it, awesome. I, I saw a thread on Reddit where somebody's like, I grabbed a copy of the pastebin entry, so it's out there. Right. Um, what are you going to do? All right, well, any other thoughts on that one? Uh, basically, you know, if this could be paired with, say... You know, uh, a watering hole attack with through Java or Flash or an Internet Explorer exploit. Then, you know, if you're using, for example, that IE8 exploit we were talking, oh yeah, yeah, sure, and then pair on top of that uh, an NVIDIA exploit to get root on the machine, then you know, could to the point where you, now you can install a root kit or something and completely take over the machine. Good times, Alan. Good times. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that, r that concludes our uh, top news stories. Now, normally this would be the part where I would mention our affiliate links, which are a great way for you to support the network without impacting your budget. You just go ahead and make the purchase you are going to make, and then a portion of your shopping session goes to us, like for Amazon or Newegg or ThinkGeek or Best Buy or Code School, which is a great way to learn by doing yes, some of these coding. Yes, I have to remember Monoprice. I'm yes. buying uh, all the stuff to install... Ethernet jacks all over my new house. Okay, so see now, Model, Model Price is a great example of an affiliate that we have in the browser extension, but don't have linked at the bottom of Jupiter Broadcasting. But I'm trying to come up with a new. Is it way actually to... in the browser extension yet? Because last time you said it, it wasn't. Well, so here's the thing, and I'm glad you asked me that because uh, we have a little bit of a problem. So we we up we updated the Chrome browser plugin to support Amazon CA, right? Yep. And yep. the issue with that is is 
I think Chrome has sort of changed the way they define different access levels because we haven't changed any of the things that it yeah, needs well, to get well, access to. Chrome changed a bunch of things about silent updates and stuff. Yeah, and so people are getting these prompts saying, hey, yeah. this thing needs more permissions to run. It, we're not doing anything shady. It's just they sort of changed some of their policies, and when we updated the plugin, it just that's when they that's when they impacted us. So uh, if you get that prompt, the please source do code say for okay. the affiliate plugin is on GitHub. If you want to audit it yourself before yeah. you install, yeah, absolutely. We make it available. It's open source up there, so we're not doing anything nefarious. If you see that prompt, so the problem we have though, Alan, is we we have found it. Firefox has been smooth from day one, like no problem. But we ha we've had continuous issues with Chrome where they've they sort of change things down the road that sort of like are that break the way they told you to do it before. So we've been a little slow with pushing out some of the updates for the Chrome browser. But I think Monoprice is in there. If it's not, uh, and you're going to do a big order, you can always email Angela at jupiterbroadcasting.com with a link to it, and she'll send it back an affiliate link. But uh, anyways, the, the nice thing about the browser extensions is that when, uh, when we do add new ones and we get that, hopefully now it's going to be streamlined now that they've sort of stabilize things out. Then we'll push out new affiliates through the browser extension. It just happens automatically and you don't have to think about it. And it's a great way to keep this network going. And uh, we really appreciate everyone who does that or supports us directly by going to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate and locking in maybe a monthly funding uh, because we are trying to keep, uh, hopefully, we'll see where this goes, but we're trying to keep things as sponsor minimum as possible. Uh, we just work with the people we really like who get us and get what we're about, and then the rest all comes from you guys. And I think that really helps keep the content genuine and focused on the topic. But, Alan, what do you say with all of that done? We go do some TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails at techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of Jupiter Broadcasting website or submitting a thread to links.techsnap.tv. We love getting your emails and answering your questions. And Alan, are you ready? Wait ah, wait a minute, Alan. Wait a minute. Before we get to that, we actually have something kind of special to chat about, don't we? People have been yes. waiting for this. Waiting for a, a while now, yes. Yeah. Uh, so as promised, finally, uh, <laughs> the videos of the talks from EuroBSDCon 2012 are now on YouTube. Yay! Yeah, we have links to a whole bunch of them. Uh, well, I, I highlighted just a couple that uh, I thought people might find particularly interesting, although all of the talks are good. Including uh, one of yours is on there. Yes. Uh, so my talk about uh, the Faultware Global Server Load Balancer in DNS is there uh, with Stefan and myself. Uh, there's also a talk from uh, Dag Erling Schmorgov, or Smorgrave. Uh, he's the guy that implemented uh, PAM in FreeBSD and a bunch of other things. Oh. Uh, he also worked on Varnation. But anyway, he gives a talk about challenges uh, in identity management and authentication in any operating system. Uh, although it's specific uh, to, there's a couple things that are specific to FreeBSD. But basically, he's talking about trying to decide what we're going to do about these problems for the future. Yeah. So that one uh, was very interesting, especially just thinking as like a thought experiment about the different issues and how to handle different things. Did you mention the uh, tuning on ZFS one? Yes. Uh, Martin ZFS. Matroska also uh, did a talk about tuning ZFS on FreeBSD, Yeah, uh, which was very good, uh, especially the, there's a lot of uh, wisdom out there on random blogs that is completely wrong. <laughs> there's also uh, a lot of stuff or like things it says not to do and so on that are very specific to Solaris. For example, so uh, if you read any of the generic ZFS guides, especially ones about Solaris, it says never make your ZFS things based on partitions. Always use whole disks because if you use just a partition, you don't have a write cache. Hmm. Right? That doesn't actually apply in FreeBSD. You're perfectly safe to go ahead and use partitions. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Which makes a lot easier to do. Yes. Right? You don't have to dedicate the whole disk to ZFS. Right. On my new laptop, I have a partition on the SSD and a partition on the hard drive, each uh, set up for ZFS while still being able to have Windows on the regular hard drive and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, I learned quite a bit in there. And he also talks about how tuning is very specific to your application and your workload. Sure. So he has a tool called uh, ZFS-Mon that allows you to monitor the caching efficiency of the different caches in ZFS, right? You have the... Arc cache, the metadata cache, the prefetch, the prefetch metadata, the uh, zfetch, and the vdev cache, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and talking about those and monitoring those and seeing which ones you, you know, all right, this one's getting a 95% cache hit ratio. I want more of that. And this one's only getting a 30% cache hit ratio, so I can just disable that one and get that RAM back. 
Uh, and it also talks about, for example, uh, VDEV cache is turned off by default because people were building, you know, free NAS boxes with 50, uh, 40 or 50 hard drives. Nothing. But only a couple of gigs of RAM. Nothing. And so the default of having, say, eight megabytes of RAM dedicated to each physical device meant that, you know, eight times 40 is a lot of RAM when you only have two gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> so the default is zero. Uh, but if you're doing a lot of small reads from the device, you can suffer performance problems. Uh, yeah. So if you're like me and you have a ZFS thing that's eight uh, three terabyte drives and you have 96 gigs of RAM, I have 32 megabytes of RAM dedicated to each device for a device cache. And that significantly improves my read speeds. Man, and it talks about a bunch of stuff like that. And it's very interesting. It's great uh, they put these online. <clears throat> yes. Uh, John Hickson, uh, who's a developer of FreeNAS, gave a talk on the system architecture of FreeNAS, so how they actually build it and how a lot of the internal stuff works. Oh, that's a must-watch. So, yes. Uh, so even if you're building, if, if, if you're trying to build an embedded appliance, it's very useful information. If you want to know how FreeNAS works more inside, I do. it's very useful information. If you want to know about making FreeNAS do something it's not really supposed to do, I do. it's also useful. Very good, yes. And then uh, Michael Dexter has gave a talk about Beehive, which is the BSD licensed hypervisor uh, which currently can run FreeBSD on top of FreeBSD, but eventually the goal is to be able to run Windows and Linux on top of FreeBSD servers, uh, or even any BSD. Uh, it's being developed on FreeBSD right now, but it, it's not. It's being done in a way that will allow it to be ported. Um, but yeah, right now our options for virtualization are like VirtualBox or QMU without KVM. Yeah, uh, and even you know. Even if you're not in love with FreeBSD like I am, uh, you know your option is like Zen or VirtualBox, or whatever. They all have a commercial version where they hide all the good features and so on. Whereas this will be completely BSD licensed, so that means you can use it. You can, you know, roll an embedded appliance with it. You can uh, do whatever you want with it. And I have great hopes for the project, and that's why I'm been. Uh, Doing beta testing with it and stuff. All right. On. I actually, I actually have a scale engine server dedicated just to running Beehive now. Oh man, I can't wait for you to share some thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, uh, in order to basically test it in a production environment without putting it in a production environment, uh, it sits beside another server that is in production, running a regular version of FreeBSD, and basically we're going to replicate the load. So every time there's a request oh. to the real server, the virtual server will get a copy of that request and do the work and then throw away the result. Uh, since no one's actually asking for that work, but That's it allows us to simulate production loads on, yeah. inside this VM to yeah. make sure that it works properly. Yeah, great idea. All right, so check out, <coughs> Alan has links to that in the show notes. I'm definitely watching that FreeNAS one because I have a FreeNAS box exactly right on the other side of that wall. So and I'm, they talk about, for example, some of the changes they made because <clears throat> it, power users wanted to be able to drop to a shell and run specific ZFS commands instead of having to use the web interface. Yeah. So they moved away from, they used to store uh, a bunch of information like the properties you had set on your ZFS yeah. in a database. Right. But then it would get out of sync if you did something manually. Yeah. So they actually changed it to the point where they actually run the ZFS get all command and actually query the ZFS to say, you know, what properties are set on this uh, data set and so on. FreeNAS is so cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I have a, so if you just, uh, I also have a link at the bottom here to basically all the videos that they posted. Uh, there's a bunch of other interesting ones, including uh, a history that walks through um, command line and text user interfaces and how they evolved from like the 60s on and what developers have, should keep in mind in order to make command line and text user interfaces applications more usable. That's awesome. I want that. Yeah. Do you know what license uh, they've put these under? Uh, the videos? I don't. Yeah. Know. They're on YouTube. I don't know. Uh, I wonder if they'll uh, say because I'd love to. I'd love to play them on the live stream. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure we can uh, ask somebody uh, the uh, at EuroBSDCon on Twitter. Uh, you know what? Maybe after the sh if I remember, I'll tweet them and say, "Can I? Can I put these? Because I, you know, some of these. Yeah. Are uh, well, because they have to splash screen in the sponsors, so I think they'd yeah. be fine with that. Yeah. All the, it looks like it's sure. all built in, but I'll ask them. Yes. All right. Should we get to our first email? Sure. We got a whole batch here. All right, here we go. So this one uh, was sent in by Anthony, and he says, uh, Hi, guys. A few nights ago, my small home server died. Oh, boy, don't I dread that ever happening. 
Uh, since VPSs are so cheap these days, I'm considering not replacing the server and just getting a VPS from GoDaddy. But I'm wondering. I guess it depends what your home server is for. But yes. Yeah, yeah. But I'm wondering which one would meet my needs. I'm not wanting to do much. I just need to run a small web page, you know, a full LAMP stack, email, and a Jabber server. Would the smallest VPS from GoDaddy likely work for this? Any advice you could give me? Keep up the great work. Well, I think, you know, the core of this question here is more about resource usage, right? And how yeah. much, yeah. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, firstly, you shouldn't run a mail server at home. But anyway, uh, yeah. So as far as how much RAM you need, per se, it depends. Yeah, uh, if you're tied to a LAMP stack and can't replace Apache with something like Nginx or Lighty, uh, you need a little bit more RAM than uh, not. Um, yeah, it could be skill set there. Yeah. yeah. Um, usually, like 256 megabytes of RAM is enough. Uh, RAM's not all that expensive, so it, it uh, likely doesn't make that big of a difference. Yeah, and you can do custom. You can email GoDaddy yeah. support and get custom. Uh, they're like so. Like uh, I would probably say, you know, so he's going to go with a CentOS box, and okay. uh, they have a CentOS box here that's uh, two gigs of RAM, sixty gigs of storage, two gigabytes of bandwidth a month, and uh, you know, if you get it, if you get it for twelve months, it's thirty-five bucks a month. So you think of two gigs of RAM yeah, for what he's that's, doing? That's more than enough. Obviously. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure he was looking. You at could even more, get a cheaper uh, one. Which only, it's only. Yeah. It's only. It's only twenty-five, twenty-six bucks a month if you wanted. Uh, if you brought that down to one gig of RAM, and the other thing and to think about with the VPS is, is lots. Even uh, you know, I've run. You know, when I started my shell provider company in two thousand and two, you know, we were running full LAMP stack on machines with like two hundred fifty-six megabytes of RAM. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Um, and for example, Ubuntu makes a cloud version of their server that has is stripped down and it's designed to be run on like 128 megabyte and 256 megabyte um, virtual machines. But there's no. But there's see. There's really no reason to stress about it with a VPS because if you if you go cheap and then you're like crap, this isn't enough. The thing about a VPS is they can turn it up. You know, they can yes. they can allocate yeah, you more can memory. Just you're add not more RAM or yeah. you know, yeah. it's only a couple dollars a month and there's no contract. You're you're not locked in yeah. for a year or something. It's not so a it's physical box. Too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well this next one I was sent in by let's go with Falcom. Let's uh Falcom. Uh, yeah, for, for the question about VPS is also oh, yeah. uh, we have a link in the roundup later on that has uh, a huge listing of uh VPS providers yep. with their pricing. Yep. So it may be a good place to look. And I think you can use our code go 20 off 5 if you shop in a GoDaddy, you get 20% off whatever the cost is there. So There's that too. All right, so the next one comes in from uh, Philim, I guess. I'm not sure. And he says, I got another exchange replacement for you guys. Hi, guys. Hope you had a good holiday and a happy new year. Just thought I'd chime in on the listener who was looking for an exchange replacement. That was last episode. He suggests Colab, and it's over at colab.org, K-O-L-A-B.org. It's just about to release version 3. They, they wanted to delay it so that way they could also release packages for Debian. They actually listen to the community. That's cool. It's truly an open source project. Zimper, I found to be more of an open core, and they use uh, more people to, uh, and they could use more people to help test their packages. Commercial support is built on top of that, and uh, they have... Uh, that which I have run into as well, by the way. Zimbra is free, but it only gets you so far for the free version, which is kind of his point here. Uh, but the greatest thing about Colab, no Java. The one glaring issue with Zimbra is that it's a festering pile of Oracle mismanaged and, ma and mismaintained junk. Anyway, Happy New Year, and don't forget to patch your PFSense boxes as 2.02. Is out. Sweet. It's been a long while since we have an email that mentioned PFSense, so uh, special thanks to that, too. Yes. Uh, also a great point, Zimbra does require Java. Um, you know, honestly, never really had any issue with it on server-side. Java server-side's pretty easy. It doesn't, you know, get all nasty. Yeah, I, I run, like, 40 or 50 Java yeah. Yeah. server instances. Yeah. I, I really, yeah. I mean, memory sometimes is I'm issue. never a fan of Java, but right. when and I like, have to, I have to, you know, in all the Minecraft servers I run for yeah. Jupyter Broadcasting, that's all Java, too. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, his point's well taken. Like, <clears> if you want to avoid it altogether, you know, you're kind of stuck with Zimbra. And, uh, uh, you know, I, my practical experiences has been fine, but I have noticed memory usage seems a bit high. All right. So uh, that was Colab. You guys can go check that out. And I've heard of Colab before. It actually looks like it's a pretty great product. Next email comes in from Tom Allen. He says, Alan and Chris, thanks for all the great material on TechSnap. You guys, I bet he's using a Mac, by the way it uh, auto-corrected the word TechSnap. Uh, you guys make Thursdays rock. I love being able to unwind to an episode of TechSnap after work and stay current on the latest security and network admin topics. I have a couple of questions for you guys, so I'll break these down, Alan. Here we go. 
A buddy of mine are working to start a social media site. He would like me to focus on security and hardening. I have what I would consider a strong programming background, albeit less focused on web languages, and we have worked with Linux for the last seven years, although I'm a little bit shy of your level of Linux administration. All right, so his first question is this. Do you recommend any sites or books which describe some of the best practice material so I can help harden a new site? I don't know that specifically, uh, but, you know, obviously you want to watch out for SQL injection. Make sure any user input is sanitized before it goes anywhere ever, right? Because you, uh, especially on social media, you need to worry about SQL injection, but also even just people injecting like JavaScript into yeah, the display of a code. page. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, yeah. So you basically you have to sanitize all user input always. Yeah. I would say instead of trying to generalize uh, your security, yeah, what if he looked at like like if he's gonna use Apache, look at specific things about Apache. If he's gonna use MySQL, look at specific things about MySQL, right? Yep. But you know, there's uh the user input thing is something you want to do yes, always for of course. Right. Uh, right. other things you know, if you're going to have photo sharing or something, make sure the photos aren't accessible without some kind of authentication. Uh, we talked a little bit about how, how Google does it, but like, you know, if Facebook kind of actually has the problem right now where you put a, f- a photo album up and you set restrictions on it saying only these people can view this photo album, but if somebody copies the actual URL of the photo, they can link it to anyone because that's just uh, a failing of Facebook's uh, CDN and so on. Uh, Whereas if Facebook somehow put a cookie on the photos to so that only people with the right access could access those photos, that wouldn't happen. If I was designing a social media site, I might be worried about something like that. Yeah. As well, yeah. right? Yeah. Is actually applying your access rules everywhere instead of only if people access content in the intended way. You know what I mean? He uh, he also like uh, by, based on his next question, like he's got the right mindset here. Check out this part of his question. He says, "Other than watching TechSnap every week, which of course I'll be doing anyways, do you recommend any good web slash network security oriented news sites which I can follow? The goal is to be able to hear about the new exploits and patch our site slash server to prevent them right. from happening to us." If you use a major application like Apache, MySQL, whatever, you need to subscribe to their mailing list for announcements about vulnerabilities. Right, FreeBSD has a mailing list for the operating system, and then there's one, Apache has one for Apache. Right, uh, I'm sure MySQL has one. Well, I, and Red Hat, I'm not and, actually on and, that one. Ubuntu, but, and you know all the different right. distros or, or FreeBSD, you know, yeah. Nginx or whatever yeah. applications you are using for your LAMP stack or whatever, uh, you know. So PHP even, uh, you get on those mailing lists. They have usually announced mailing lists that are very low traffic. They only have an email when there's a new version or an exploit. And that's the best way to hear about the exploits, you know, when they're announced. Uh, if you're really into it, you know, the full disclosure mailing list yeah. that we link stuff from all the time. Mm-hmm. That's where people go to announce stuff when they find uh, an exploit. And as so a, a you episode... hear about it when the person who comes up with the exploit announces it rather than hearing about it when the people who are being targeted by the attack get around to announcing their yeah. side of it. I've been, you know, episode 91 in the chat room points out uh, reddit. Dot, or netsec.reddit.com, N-E-T-S-E-C. Yep. I've, I've been trolling there lately, and it's been interesting because you see some things pop up before they get mainstream coverage, and then a couple days later they get coverage. So that might not be a bad place to check out. You know what I've done? Instead of subscribing to a lot of the mailing lists because my inbox is a horrible monster from the depths of hell that needs to be shot in the head, what yep. I do is I subscribe because a lot of them also put out RSS feeds. So I have a folder in my Google Reader that's just like all of all of the different projects that I need to be aware about that I subscribe to their security vulnerabilities in an RSS feed, and I just yep. go there and I just read those, and you know that's how I stay on top of it too. Uh, yeah, a uh, FreeBSD project has something called VUXML, which is basically a vulnerability update XML list. It's basically an RSS feed of all vulnerabilities in the ports tree also very useful to subscribe to uh yeah but yeah i usually am only on the mailing list for a couple of very specific things like freebsd itself uh because i only get emails when there's a new version or there's a, a, an exploit yeah yeah it's not too it's not the noise level is not too bad yeah no. so you know I, I get like two or three emails a year usually it's all right so- uh, so he has a third part, third and last part of his email. He goes, uh, we're currently researching hosting services for our new site. The identified characteristics of our new site are as follows. 
primarily written using PHP, JavaScript with, you know, Ajax and jQuery and all that fanciness, stores many posts by users with, you know, so it's going to have an extensive database and will include images in the post, but not very large. He then goes on to ask, would Scale Engine be best suited for our needs? Amazon Web Services, a traditional hosting service such as GoDaddy or HostGator. Any more info you could give, uh, please let me know. We're looking to minimize costs while going... Uh, while going with a service that has the capability of scaling up if the site takes off. Obviously, we'll be using nothing kills a user base. Obviously, nothing kills a user base faster than a slow or buggy experience. What do you think for hosting, Alan? Uh, Well, Scale Engine is specifically designed for uh, PHP-based applications, so it's a good option. Uh, With our pricing starting at $25 a month, uh, which will cover most uh, sites until they get a very large amount of traffic, uh, it's a good choice. It's cheaper than keeping an Amazon EC2 instance running 24-7. And the beauty is, like the name says, if you do start to take off, it scales yeah, up. Yeah, it, you pay as you scale, basically. Uh, we charge you based on CPU time and SQL queries. So that means you can so, scale down, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It means if you have a big spike of traffic, we handle that, you pay for it. The next month, you not popular again, uh, your bill goes back down. Well, or like in our case, like uh, Jupiter Broadcasting, very popular on Sundays. Yep. And uh, Sundays, you know, we use a lot more bandwidth and traffic than we do pretty much any other day of the week, yep. uh, with, except for maybe Thursdays, Alan. And yes. so, uh, well, also you know, Thursdays you have two shows, or right. depending yeah. on, on how you adjust. If you look at it in UTC, you actually have three shows on Thursday. Wow! Wow! I'm a because, busy man. I'm busy because, <laughs> because uh, the faux show on Wednesday night, right? In UTC, that's actually very very early on on Thursday morning. So what you're saying is I'm super hardcore. Is what yeah. you're saying. Um, yeah. So, anyways, the, but but it's great for us because, nor in in a traditional hosting system, I would have to pay for the allowance for that all the time. Like I would always have yeah, to make you sure you basically have to pay for enough service to be able to handle the most load you might ever get that yeah. you might ever get. Right. Exactly. So uh, all like, right. Well, that, that's that's how Jupiter Broadcasting's relationship with Scale Engine started. Yeah. Right. You had the Jupiter Colony site on a regular web host, and the beta for Star Trek Online was going to open and so much traffic on your site that they shut you down. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, yeah, you're going to have to pay us hundreds of dollars a month for a dedicated server for a traffic spike that's only going to last another week. Yeah, it was so close. I'm like, you don't understand. The game's about yeah. to release. Once it releases, all the Everything big rumors... will go back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so you switch to Scale Engine, you know, the spike happened, it cost you an extra like $4 or something and then... You went back well, to and if I'm being completely honest, and I, I mean, I don't know if you would do this for everybody that would ask, but I mean, it's, it's also as part of the services, your technical services. I mean, you, yes, know, you well, helped me with that migration moved, in a way. You moved the site over for you, which uh, is something that we do. Yes, we provide free migration I mean, assistance. From a, somebody who's extremely busy and I just have so many other things to do, the fact that I, you know, that was, that was huge too. I mean, that's just yeah. huge. Well, Remember, the only reason why we didn't have your site moved over in 30 minutes, the reason it took four hours, we had to wait for your ISP to re-enable your account so you could access it. Right, because they just, yeah, they turned the whole they thing off. They just turned it, like, they took away your FTP access even. Yeah. Uh, where it's like, sure, leave the website turned off, but we need FTP access so we can copy the files and yeah. get the database. Can I get my database? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so now we have an email from Frank, Alan, and uh, he says, uh, Hey, Chris and Alan, thanks for answering my question last week, but now I have a whole new problem for you today. I've got a job at a data center as a tech, and I did say tech. By that, I mean the go for mule. The only CPU I've touched in two months is the label maker. Anyway, I just had a, I had a chance to look over other people's shoulders, and I am learning a lot. We have a client that runs Unix servers, I don't know which kind, that uses jails. They have an instance of Tomcat running in three different jails connecting to the same database. My question is, what benefit... What is the benefit of using Unix jails? I understand that uh, I understand that they I understand what they are, but I'm lost I'm lost as to when, where, and why it is to my benefit to use them. What is the benefit to using three instances of Tomcat versus one? It all goes over the same equipment and will suffer the same network bottlenecks and the sa- as the same single instance would. It would access the same database and suffers from the same limitations as single instance would. So what's the benefit? Any help? Greatly appreciated. Um, I don't know about their specific thing. Uh, jails are nice. Basically, anywhere where you would use virtualization to separate things or to for security or whatever, jails are handy. Um, one of the f- features I love about jails is the fact that you can stop a jail, pick it up, and move it to a different machine. Oh. That's very, very helpful. Um, 
man, don't you just like it from a config isolation and user yeah, exactly. isolation or standpoint? Not, not just config isolation, but you know, I've had problems where I need to be able to run two different versions of PHP at the same time, right? Like 5.2 and 5.4 or something. One in each jail and, and set up the web servers or whatever, and it works great. Or I need yeah. two users to be able to have root access but not be able to touch each other's stuff. Right. Works great in that instance. That's too. a great example. Or, you know, uh, Java is just messy. So I always Java always runs in a jail so that all of its crazy dependencies and stuff are all isolated. Yeah. Right? Uh, so yeah, keeping apps separate is just easier for maintenance and stuff. Uh, but also, yeah, like I had I had a, a MongoDB that was on one of our original scale engine servers, which only had had a maximum of eight gigabytes of RAM. And it was starting to get uh, pretty busy now, and so literally stop it. Uh, archive it up, move it over, start it back up. I moved the internal IP address that it was assigned to, and bam, a little bit later, it took maybe 20, 30 minutes, something like that, just because of the amount of data that had to be moved. And it was back up, and now it was on a machine with 96 gigs of RAM, and it was happy and ready to go. <clears throat> there's a- so it's just that kind of containerization that's also made it very useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's lots of different reasons you can do it. Uh, you know, you can have different settings in a jail. You can have different yeah. uh, things. For their Tomcat setup, it may be that their three Tomcats are for different customers or something, and so they need to be separated, or there's some advantage to them being separated. Um, in newer versions of FreeBSD, you can do resource limits on a jail. Oh, yeah. So you could uh, run three separate Tomcats, but have them set so that each one can only use so much RAM or so much CPU or something. Mm. Um it may be that at some point Tomcat might crash and it's not easy to automatically restart it or something. Right. So by running three on each machine and load balancing between them, if one of them crashes, you're not Taking in an outage situation customers. anymore. You, well, or if one crashes, just, only one customer yeah. goes down. Yeah, well, or, or if it's load balanced across all three, like all of them serve all customers, if one crashes, the other two are still up. Yeah. All right, Alan. So there you go. There's, uh, yeah, I'd need to know more specifics about why, uh, what they're doing to know why they might do it that way. But you know, if you want to know, ask the guy to set it up. Now uh, we've got an email from viewer David, who has a few corrections for mm -hmm. us. It says, Dear Alan and Chris, I've been listening to the show since some time around episode 40, and I've been listening to the Linux Action Show for years. I'd like to point out a solution to the problem you mentioned in the SSH FUD segment. We actually got a bit of feedback about this. A couple and of people to, yeah. It, yeah. And to correct a mistake... Uh, in one of your user email replies. Firstly, central management of crypto keys of all sorts, including SSH and SSL keys, has been solved through PKI, uh, which includes key creation, signing, distribution, revocation, and tracking. Right. Uh, even in the chat room during the show, a, a bunch of people pointed out that you can use SSL certificates uh, in place of SSH keys so that they can have an expiration date and you can have a revocation list and so on. Yeah. Uh, and sure, that's great. Although my... SSH client on my Windows machine doesn't support that. He uh, he mentions that uh, uh, that uh, this functionality was recently added by Red Hat to their free IPA product, which is awesome. You guys Google this free IPA one word, uh, it's like the beer. It's similar to Active Directory, but for Unison Linux, it's a whole authentication system. It does key distribution. Nice. It's, it looks really cool. So check out free IPA, guys. Uh, and then here's the correction. Now buckle up because I read this a couple of times and it. I don't think he. I think he kind of. Got the words a little wrong, but maybe it'll make sense. You let me know. All right. In your response to the question about VDI brokers, I think you misunderstood what the user was asking about. You mentioned virtualization. Well, not exactly, but we didn't know. Like, I pointed this out when we were the talking. The term, but the verbiage. Yeah. 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 So here he kind of has, I think he's trying to clear up the verbiage, but I think he kind of gets yeah. his verbiage mixed up. Let me go on. He says, uh, you mentioned virtualization management tools, which help the manager of a virtualized infrastructure. A VDI manager is not for the person managing the infrastructure, but rather for the users who are consuming the VDI, that is, logging onto the virtual desktops. The manager is more like a load balancer or resource pooling tool which abstracts the individual virtual machines into a pool, allowing users to point their RDP client or Citrix receiver to the broker, which then tracks the virtual machine in use behind it. And it gives the user connection to the next available one. Some brokers even support profiles, so a user will always get virtual machines with specific characteristics. Enjoy the show. Please keep up the hard work. Now, you see... Right. Where, where so basically, what he's saying is the VDI broker, or virtual desktop interface broker, is controlling people yeah. running their... Uh, basically, thin clients, where the 
user is logging into a virtual machine and using it as their desktop. Right. Uh, rather than, you know, the sysadmin trying to manage something, this is users connect to the broker and get directed to a specific virtual machine. Yeah, based on load or whatever the criteria yeah. is. Yeah. Or, you know, it's one that somebody's not already logged into or something. That makes sense. Thanks, David, for the corrections. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's a, it's, it, comes it seems like though. a weird thing. It's like, I thought Microsoft would solve that with, like, terminal services rather than with this is like virtualization they, brokers. I don't know. This is like an alternative to terminal services where oh, you yeah. get more of a full machine, I guess. You know, because yeah, you're remoting into a remote machine that's running on a really powerful server, but the whole operating system, the whole virtual machine is your own private instance. Right. So it's like terminal but services. But they're dedicated so that multiple people, yeah. Yeah, so it's you're like right. having a, 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 You'd have to have like, roaming profiles. It's like an office and, where you have a whole bunch of machines and... And you could just sit down at any one. Just, yeah. Yeah. And... and Except for your virtual, your remote desktoping, but into any one of a bunch of virtual machines. It's kind of like uh, drag, yeah, yeah. So, and that's great, I guess. But uh, the broker is probably something that's going to come down to what virtualization you're using, whether that's yeah. Hyper-V, VMware, yeah. or Citrix, yeah. or whatever. And yeah, exactly. All Nothing right. I've ever dealt with. I only virtualize servers. I've done it. I've done a little bit in the Citrix environment, and uh, yeah. So I, 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 like, I, 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 I know one student that had Thin Client set up at his house. Oh, really? But those were dedicated. Oh, not, oh, oh. Uh, I, for a time, for a time, I, I managed uh, at the bank I worked at, I had like a hundred and, I, I think it was 106 or 112 <coughs> NT4 terminal services, all running Citrix, Metaframe, 1.8, which then I had to move to Windows 2000, and then I had to move to Windows 2003, and then move along the Citrix versions as they went. Let me tell you, Alan, those were the days. Starting with NT4 as terminal services, Wow. Wow, that is like people. You want to hear some war stories? I, yeah. I had I had like batch file scripts to reboot crap because NT four was oh my, I'm getting a little verklempt. Why yeah, don't we move I, on? I remember the first kiosk I ever built. It was a, an NT machine, <laughs> and yeah. then when the screensaver started, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, instead of a screensaver, it had a batch script that would kill all open applications, log you out, and then start the screensaver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that I, when somebody was using the kiosk, they log into it, use it. When they walked away, it would log them out. My blood pressure, I feel like my blood pressure has gone up just talking about it. I remember the, the, the Citrix terminal services clients would dial in instead of use the internet. Oh, yeah. The internet was just as slow back then. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, we got an email from Frank. And uh, Frank loves Keychain. He says, hi there. Just watched the show about SSH FUD, which I enjoyed, by the way. I wanted to point you to a nice tool that I use every day, which is called keychain and he has a link to a gen 2 uh, keychain guide uh what it is is it lets you do uh boy what it is what it lets you do is the first time you open it up it asks you for your key pass and afterwards it lets you use the unlocked key via a unix socket to log into an ssh server this is not all that great by itself but just imagine the following situation and when it all makes sense and it's such a beauty to use let's say let's say you have several servers lying around running ssh which i do you have your SSH key, and it lets you, say, log in to server 1. And from there, you want to log into server 2, which happens to me quite a bit. Uh, usually, what you would need to do is you would, you would have to be able to... SS, you'd have to have your SS, SSH key on server 1, which server 2 allows to log in. Uh, uh, but SSH lets you do agent forwarding. This way, you log on to server 1 and take your keychain with you when you later log into server 2. This way, you have the same authorized key files on all your servers, which you would simply deploy manage using Puppet. Like I said, yep. it's just a thought, and I wanted to point it out to you guys. Which you kind of alluded to a little bit. Yeah, um, specifically, I think next week, I'm going to do a little segment about agent forwarding uh, and how to make it work through sudo, which is something that normally breaks it, and a bunch of other things. Uh, but basically solving some of these problems by actually having uh, uh, an SSH key agent, whether that's something on your, like, uh, keychain on your Linux box or the PuTTY authentication agent on Windows or whatever, uh, to have your SSH key only exist on your terminal. But, you know, I SSH into one server, and when I SSH into a second server from there, the first server passes the request for authentication through to my put agent on my desktop. Ah. So I connect to server one, server one connects to server two. When server two asks for my SSH key, server one forwards that through to my agent on my computer. 
I enter the password uh, to decrypt my key, pass it through, and all of a sudden now I'm lo- logged in with my key to server two, even though server one never has my key. Slick. That way I don't. That way my private key exists only in one place, encrypted with a password on my desktop. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't exist on all my servers to allow me to go f- to server hop. That I like. Although that. I don't do that I much like server. That. I don't use that much server hopping because I just happened to I just open <laughs> m- like forty SSH windows because yeah, yeah. I'm I'm crazy. Yeah, but yeah, it would be a, a great way to do it. All right, so now so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little mini tutorial on that I think next week. Oh, I, dude, you should. That'd be basically I read that guy's email and uh, read more about it and kept reading and then found that when I sudoed on one of my servers, it broke it because it doesn't pass that environment variable. Uh huh. But then I saw on uh, Server Fault a way to get around that, and oh. so I'm going to cover it all in a nice awesome. tutorial thing. Awesome. That'll be great. I look yeah. forward to that. Uh, <clears> all right. So now this will be the last email in the feedback segment. We've got one email I'm going to cover in the roundup. It comes from Remy, and he says, uh, now this is, again, about the SSH key management. And this one might be handy for any of us not Geos users. Uh, he says, he goes on and says, uh, a programming shop I used to work for had the same problem. You know, all these servers, SSH keys getting out of date, people come and go, and you don't know when to remove their old key. He says, uh, when they were, while they were using Chef to manage the keys, sometimes they had to add a key manually when one of the developers needed access. Most of the time, they would remove it. But, you know, sometimes you forget. I've written a Nodgeos... Yeah, well, it's a contractor, and they don't work there anymore, and so oh, they... Yeah. Or somebody gets fired, and you just forget. Yeah. yeah. Or you okay. fire the sysadmin that does it. Uh, <laughs> I've written a Nodgeos check, which helped a little. It would scan all the authorized key files for all users and check them against a whitelist on an off-site location via HTTPS with a hard-coded certificate. The list contained the following, server, username, SSH key. If there was a key not on the list, it would trigger a critical, which would then be escalated if a key was open for, if it was open for more than 48 hours. Uh, there would only be, there were only two people who could edit the whitelist. The check would be revoked, the check would be revoked, would not revoke access or something. It would just not notify... Uh, right, so it wasn't, it, you know, if it found a key that wasn't supposed to be there, it wouldn't just take that key away, it would just notify someone so that uh, it could He goes on to say he wanted to open source the script, but the shop he's working for wouldn't let him do it. But it's only 50 lines of Python, it wouldn't be too hard for somebody to write up. Yeah, with the general description there, it'd be easy for someone to, to write something like that. It's a great idea having Nagios check it against a whitelist, and then just flag it in your Nagios dashboard. Yep. That's totally manageable, yeah, I right, like You that. know, it can escalate, and uh, yeah. so you can have it, you know, check once an hour or something. It sees the key, and it's fine with it. But if that key stays there for more than a day or something, then it starts emailing you once yeah. a day saying, hey, get rid of this key. Hey, get rid of this key. Uh, also, just as a, as a quick plug aside, because uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, watch a lot of, he watches a lot of our shows and, and writes in, uh, he has a great blog over at Raymi, R-A-R-A-Y-M-I-I dot org. Uh, where uh, he created a uh, an email backup script, which is really cool. It's a little Python script that backs up your inbox to an HTML5 uh, indexed uh, file, which is really neat. He's got some other scripts over there. He's got a nice little site, so uh, R-A-Y-M-I-I dot org. You can go check out his stuff. And thanks, you guys. Thank you to everybody who emailed into the show. We want more emails, so go over to uh, text, or go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, hit the contact link, or go to techsnap dot or yeah, techsnap.reddit.tv. What is it? Techsnap. Links. Links.techsnap.tv. I don't know why I can't. Or techsnap.reddit.com. It, you know, whatever. It's, yep. It all goes to the same place. But, Alan, with all that done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup are stories that didn't quite fit at the top of the show. We still want to talk about them, though. Maybe give you some links to follow up on your own. And many of these links are supplied by our awesome subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Mr. Jude, are you ready for our first roundup link? Nope. All right. Now, you actually teased Yours. about this earlier. A little uh, bit. The, uh, f- the uh, VPS uh, sort of uh, comparison site that... Yeah, it's just basically a, like an index that has a whole bunch of different VPS providers. But what uh, they do... You filter them by different things. Which I really like is they let you break it down by coast or country. Like, you know, you can do Seattle, Los Angeles, or you can do New York, or you can even go to Ireland, Europe areas. Or what I like even more, 
you can choose the virtualization platform they use, Zen, KVM, yes, like VMware. If, you, if you're if you're very specific about yeah. oh, I want something that's based on Zen, then yeah. they have a list there. They also have a list of stuff that will let you run FreeBSD. Yeah, so then you can look at all the ones and their different prices. And now I haven't used the site myself, but they have comments and all those kinds of things. So you might check it out. It's over at lowendbox.com, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. All right, now our uh, first actual roundup story, a little bit of more information about that Netflix outage that was caused by an Amazon outage. Yes, so Netflix and a bunch of other services were out on uh, New Year's or Christmas Eve, and it turns out it was a developer at Amazon accidentally deleted some data that broke their elastic load balancing service. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Just, so just it, it comes down RM to yeah, a little bit. it was human error, but also why does one person have the ability to break elastic load balancing like that? Yeah, I was I like, don't... obviously this was an accident or whatever, but it I, seems like you know, Amazon's a Washington company, and I've worked with people who have worked with Amazon. Uh, a couple of people actually who've worked <clears> with <throat> Amazon in their infrastructure area, and I've been told there's a lot of duct tape. A lot of twine in there, Alan. A lot. Yeah. Like, I, I, the words, both of them, who never spoke to each other, both of them used the words, if you knew how bad it was, you would never use their service. Now, I don't know if it's still that way, because they haven't worked there for a few years, but that is what they both said independently to me. Yeah, well, you know, that, that tends to happen, right? Especially when you're, yeah. you know, As you're growing, new yeah, stuff. Inventing, uh, yeah. And you go back and you sort of fix it up and sort of tighten things down and, and get things working right. Uh, all yeah. right, so this next story I don't think is going to surprise too many people in our audience. Uh, antivirus products are rubbish, says Imperva, I guess is how you say their name. They just, got, they just wrapped up a study on a whole batch of antivirus products. 82, was it 82 or 50 something? Something like a whole bunch of like all of the mainstream antivirus products from Microsoft and Norton and McAfee and Kaspersky. And they basically revealed what all of us probably expected. Less than 5% of antivirus solutions in the study were able to initially detect previously non-categorized viruses and that many solutions took up to a month or longer following the initial scan to update their signatures to do the detection. Right. So basically, antiviruses are a blacklist, right? They have a, a list of signatures that they detect stuff against. And while most of them claim to have heuristics to try to detect viruses that aren't necessarily known yet, most of them don't. Yeah. Or, you know, they're very... Uh, basic and and aren't able to detect something new. And I'm not sure, like, uh, I know Nod32 is supposed to have heuristics and a couple of others. I don't know how those fared, but they go on to point out that, uh, you know, variants that are limited in distribution, such as, like, government worms and things like that, are almost going to be uh, not caught by these any of these things that require on a bunch of identifications to build up a signature. Yeah, database. almost all the malware that gets added to antiviruses is because... Researchers People. submit them to yeah. services that distribute these to the AV vendors. And it seems like... You know, uh, on, on GeekShed, the IRC network, where uh, we host the TechSnet or Jupiter Broadcasting chat room, there are a couple of places uh, or groups like um, Bleeping Computer and... Um, so, uh, a few others, and a bunch of the people that are involved in those actually work at uh, antivirus companies now, and you know they're very interested in getting copies of malware in order to sure. dissect them and build these um, signature databases. But it's, uh, it, the research paper goes on to suggest that perhaps due to the cost of antivirus, the time it takes to management, the performance hit that you get on the system, that in a lot of scenarios, antivirus might not can actually be worth it. That's why there isn't any on my machines. There's not any on my machines either. Now, I, my clients, I have them install it, but... Yes, and, you know. Yeah. But it, right. also, it, uh, it makes me laugh at things like the PCI DSS, the, the rules about processing credit cards mm -hmm. that, you know, recommend that you run an updated antivirus on all your servers. Yeah. It's like, I'm not putting an antivirus on well, my server. Like that bank I worked at, the FDIC audit would check for this. They, would, they had a technology component of the audit. In fact... It was that FDIC audit that mandated we upgrade from NT4 to Windows 2000. And it had only been out for like a year or two. And then, you know, mm -hmm. you get this kind of antivirus. And anyways, yeah, so sometimes it comes from a mandate. Now, uh, maybe some bad news from IRS for a few IRC servers out there. Is this what I'm gathering? Yes, uh, there was an exploit for IRCD Ratbox 2.0 and the Charbidus IRCD uh, that was exploited and took down a bunch of the bigger servers at EFNet, which is one of the oldest IRC networks. Ah, yeah. Uh, so any network that runs uh, IRCDs based on Ratbox or Charbidus, uh is vulnerable to this exploit that has to do with the um, server capability uh, negotiation. Huh. 
So basically, when a client first connects, uh, they log in as a client, but you could also attempt to connect as a server. And um, you can negotiate what capabilities your server has, and there's some uh, insufficient checking on stuff in there. And basically, you can cause uh, uh, like a memory free on a null or something. I forget what it is. But you can crash the IRCD. Um, <laughs> I know that some IRCDs, like the one that Geekshed uses, allows us to define certain ports as client only or server only, so that the server protocol won't answer on the client port. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, but even in that case, you know, the server ports are usually open anyway. The EFNet should have a little better security than, say, Geekshed does. But uh, yeah, uh, I basically tweeted this story when uh, someone was. Uh, Curious, they were trying to connect to EFNet and they were getting connection refused from the server, meaning that the IRCD wasn't running on that server. Uh, and it turned out it was because the server had been crashed by the yeah. system. <laughs> that sucks. Uh, they have a, a graph of their um, users, and you can see there's this giant chunk missing where a lot of users oh. were disconnected by crashed servers. Oops. Now, Alan, are you familiar with Snapchat or Poke? No. Have you, what about Poke? No. So these are that both was very confusing because it used to be a concept thing. of poking yeah. on Facebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they pulled a Microsoft and they took something we already know and they changed what it means. Um, so uh, Snapchat and Poke are both like these sort of think of Mission in, uh, Mission Impossible where this message will self destruct. It's like text messaging only. It doesn't run over SMS. And I send you something and I can set it to automatically expire and self delete. So like teenagers are using it to send pictures of their junk. Adults are using it to you know, text with people they're having affairs with, et cetera, et cetera, right? Any, anytime you'd yeah. want to send a message and have it auto-destruct, that way there's no trace that you ever sent the message, right? So, of course, Facebook's got to get in on this game, and now, now we find out that, oh, turns out there's a bug that's been revealed that, uh, that, that can show deleted Snapchat videos. Now, Snapchat well, just... Well, uh, I actually read the story, and what it turns out to be it's is... It's unviewed. Well, basically... Uh, when you get sent the message, Snapchat stores it in a temporary folder, and then when you view it, it deletes right, it. Right, right. But if you, say, have your iPhone connected to your computer, you can copy the files out of that folder and keep them. Yep, and uh, Poke makes the same yep. mistake. It keeps them in something called Media Card on your phone. So if you get access to somebody's phone before they've read it, you can go into that Media Card folder using a program called Media Browser and go pull yep. it out. Yeah, so... If you're the owner of the phone and you want to keep the messages, you can. If you're an attacker, you may be able to copy the messages as well. And even if they were deleted, you may be able to forensically read the SSD card or whatever and get the files back that way as well. The real problem here is people trusting some random app to yeah. <laughs> securely delete. It's like if you, if you want to have something like this, then you need encryption. And you need to control and the server. Honestly, stuff. you really do. Yeah, well, in, in this case, it's the stuff on the phone. But yeah, you basically, yeah. you need encryption and, and yeah. you know, revoking keys or expiring keys and stuff. I would never, ever actually think these things. Because it would seem like it would just take an, a warrant, and then the, the authorities would say, all right, well, just store all of the communications for this user for the next 30 days. Right, and, then, and, you know, there's that. But I'm just talking about, you know, if you're just worried about someone seeing this picture that you probably shouldn't be sending over Facebook anyway. Um, and honestly, sometimes people get around it by just taking screenshots on their phone. Yeah. Snapchot's supposed to notify the user, but I don't know if it always works. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, funny. all kinds of stuff like that comes down to don't, <laughs> don't trust random apps. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. You want something that's actually been audited by yeah. someone that knows anything. And um, Now, <clears> this... this if, you, if you don't want somebody to see a picture, don't take the picture. <laughs> right. and, and definitely don't share the picture. Right. Yeah. Uh, the next story was provided by our subreddit. They wanted to make sure you saw this one, Alan. F testing is going for uh, FreeBSD on the Raspberry Pi. What do you think well, of that? Specifically, uh, you're, you're going to miss part of it. They've got Go, the Google programming language, running on a Raspberry oh, Pi. Oh, yeah, they do. I thought Running on FreeBSD. I was more interested in the fact that FreeBSD is running on the Raspberry Pi. That's FreeBSD has been story. running on the Raspberry Pi since MeetBSD in no the beginning of November. Now, is Although, this they've made a bunch of improvements since then. Uh, but okay. the interesting thing here is that they ported it so you can run the Go programming language. Meh. So you can write apps on your Raspberry Pi in this new easy-to-use portable programming language. That is so esoteric. <laughs> well, uh, it was interesting. Uh, there was a talk about uh, writing an implementation of SCTP, which is the Stream Control Transfer Protocol. It's uh, 
not a replacement for, but something to supplement TCP, a, a new protocol that allows you to do like multipath and stuff over the internet. Mm. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. And FreeBSD is the reference implementation of it. Uh-huh. Um, just like FreeBSD was the reference implementation of IPv6, in case uh-huh. people know that. Um, anyway, uh, so it's kind of a big step to have another programming language, especially, you know, people are interested in these Raspberry Pis, and they, part of the point of Raspberry Pi is to get people back into programming on embedded devices and so on. So opening this uh, modern, learnable programming language to that platform is very useful. I, I guess. But yes, uh, I'm very interested <laughs> in uh, running FreeBSD on my Raspberry Pi. I just need to find a power supply for my I Raspberry guess, Pi. So I guess I the world loves Go, and I'm the only asshole in the room who thinks Go is just another language that is... Well, it is. Um, now, if... Sadly, there must be demand if the they're porting it to FreeBSD on the Pi. I mean, that's about as esoteric as it gets, and if there's demand for that, it must be popular. Um, eh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I've never written anything in Go. I'm not a programmer. But um, sadly, the, um, th- there was a talk about implementing SCTP in Go at EuroBSDCon, but it doesn't look like that video got, is up, and it may be because uh, the guy didn't consent to have his video published. Oh. Or maybe it'll... I noticed one extra video popped up today when all the other videos came out yesterday. So maybe it'll pop up in the next couple of days. If it doesn't, I would assume that it, it isn't uh, going it's gonna to come happen. Up. Yeah. Uh, but it was interesting to see how much less code you could write it in Go than C and so on. I don't know. It, it, looked, uh, it came out looking pretty good. Maybe I should email Radio at jupiterbroadcasting.com and ask him to explain what Go is to me because I'm lost. Yeah, uh, I, I, no, like that was the first time I'd ever heard talk about it either. All right, the next email, or the next story came from an email. It came from Mitch. He says, "Guys, the Navy did a great job of creating. You ready for this, Alan? 3D Android malware. It's an odd statement it's, and it's kind of scary. Yeah, well, hold on, I'll tell you. I know, right? And kind of scary, but I would like to think uh, maybe uh, maybe it's uh, the Navy just trying to protect us. He, he links to this MIT Technology Review story." Uh, they call it some of the best of 2012. You ready for this? The U.S. Naval Warfare Center created an Android app that secretly records your environment and reconstructs it as a 3D virtual model for the malicious user to browse. And they have examples of how it pulls in images, sounds. Uh, uh, for the phones that support it, it can even pull in barometric data about the area you're in. <laughs> right, so so the malware isn't 3D. Is, yeah, so the point is right, to... Right. Uh, Infect someone's phone and keep track of where they are. Yeah, and sort of reconstruct the world around them and, and, and yes. I would guess pull out intelligence data about that. Well, yeah, um, it's like, you know, if, if you could uh, infect the phone of, you know, a courier or something that was going into a building you happen to maybe want to raid but don't oh, know what yeah. the floor plan looks like by, you know, almost like echolocation off the phone, you could be measuring where the walls are. And, Actually, you know. it's funny you say that. Google ran a demo where uh, doing the drive-by of their Google Street cars, and they were bouncing Wi-Fi signals inside buildings, and they would try to they could they could actually guess where like posts were in the building, and and even get kind of a rough idea of rooms. There's an interesting paper on it online, and they mm-hmm. were thinking they could even maybe use this eventually if they they'd have to have other units around the building at the same time, but they might be able to map out portions of the building by actually just by using the radios on mobile devices. Mm-hmm. Very interesting stuff. So there you go. It's, I guess, technically 3D malware. Um, I did see that headline, and so it was once Mitch sent that in, I thought... Right, right we so I thought it was something that tried to display something in 3D on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> like a cube. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some malware there. Uh, all yeah. right, Alan, next story in the roundup. Fraudulent certificate for Google domains found after a mistake by a Turkish CA. Right, so the Turkish uh, certificate authority Turk Trust <laughs> accidentally I love the granted... The certificate they gave to star.ego.gov.tr, which is obviously something to do with the Turkish government, uh, instead of a regular certificate, it was what's called a subordinate CA certificate. So basically said that uh, gov.tr can issue certificates. Uh, now, you know, it seems like when a Turkish company uh, gives subordinate access to the whole government, it seems kind of like they didn't do that by accident. Yeah. Although they also gave it to some other domain that I couldn't make heads or tails of. Uh, but the ego.gov.tr used that subordinate CA to issue fake certificates for google.com. Womp womp. So that's, you know, that's why I say accidentally in sarcastic air quotes. Right. Uh, 
but Google has moved to blacklist those certificates in uh, Firefox and Chrome and so forth. The same way they did with the previous fake Google certificates from DigiNotar. Hmm. Turk Trust. Yeah. <laughs> Amer- well, I guess we have an, there is an Ameritrust. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just at some point you wonder why uh, a certificate authority that is that subordinate to, say, its government uh, is Got, in the yeah. root certificate trust mm-hmm. uh, by Microsoft and so on. Mm-hmm. Alan. Yeah. Have you ever wondered what's in Steve Ballmer's inbox? I mean, I know I have. <laughs> now we kind of get a little we get a little insight. Uh, I, I, I assume it's worse than my inbox. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thanks to a quick acting uh, user out on the internet, he snapped up Steve Ballmer at Outlook.com when Microsoft yes, uh, launched so, the uh, Outlook. It was a reporter from PC Pro, which is a UK <laughs> magazine. <laughs> Great. And they noticed that Microsoft had left that address available, so they snapped up. Steve Bomber at Outlook.com and let it sit there for a while in a queue messages and uh, take a look at them and see what people said. The overwhelming majority of email landing in the uh, Pursuit of Steve Bomber account is, of course, spam. Uh, but he did occasionally get email, genuine emails from a Microsoft customer or prospective employees. And there were things like complaining about Windows 8 UI, complaining about treatment at a Microsoft store. Uh, but Windows 8 complaints, I love this. Customers are pissed and they're emailing, they're trying to email Steve Ballmer about it. <laughs> That's going to work. <laughs> the prospective employees one is worse because if you're trying to work at Microsoft and you don't realize that yeah. Steve Ballmer at Outlook.com is not going to be Steve Ballmer's inbox, right? or not realize that you're not going to be able to directly email Steve Ballmer. <laughs> Yeah, you know when Apple when Apple rolled out their own email service, they registered Steve at me dot com and Steve at iCloud dot com for Steve Jobs. Like they thought of this, and you know what? They actually respond to people who email those accounts too. Right. Uh, I, you know, Microsoft's a big company, a lot of moving parts. A lot yeah, of and you know, Outlook dot com is yet another domain, right? They have Hotmail dot com and Hotmail dot every country, and and let's be frank, Live dot com and Passport dot com. We whole can't bunch of expect that ones. Steve Ballmer would actually use Outlook dot com. That would be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, all right. Next story in the what roundup. What email is silly? Well, I just like the idea that he doesn't use his own product, but uh, yeah. you know, whatever. Uh, Facebook patches a webcam snooping vulnerability. Oh, great. Oh, I'm gonna get the tape uh, out right now. I'm not sure like if this was a flash app or exactly what it was and uh but apparently there is an exploit where uh third parties could cause Facebook to enable your webcam and you know they could be voyeuristic uh but also it allowed them to post videos on your profile for other people to see. Uh-huh. They combine those two things together and you could have all kinds of fun. So the user would have to be tricked into visiting a malicious page and clicking to activate their camera, and then after some time of period, tricked into clicking again to stop publish the video. Not impossible, but tricky. Yeah. There you go. I, he'll get a little Facebook bug bounty money for that, though, if it's legit. Uh, yes, they did, and they, they uh, decided it must be pretty big because Facebook gave them four or five times the regular bounty. Well, you think about that. I mean, yeah, that is a bad one. But also the difficult. fact that Facebook's default bounty is only $500. I mean... There's probably a lot of times when people are using Facebook and they are not wearing clothes. Like they're just sitting in their underwear at their computer. Yep. I'm not saying I ever do that because I don't really use Facebook. Yeah, but I don't use Facebook that much. That could be embarrassing for some folks. Uh, yep. One last kind of unofficial story in the roundup is just to follow up My on the... cam lights up when you use it, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. That's and good. also the uh, control panel thing pops up and annoys Although you, now that you say that, you know, next week we're going to have a story on here where uh, attackers managed to subvert the uh, LED light on uh, webcams. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> uh, why don't we give a mention about the FreeBSD Foundation and the donation drive they were doing? This has gone yes. really well. Uh, so we talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, a story on Slashdot and Hacker News about how the FreeBSD Foundation hadn't even got to 50% of its funding goal for 2012. Yeah. Uh, and... This was only a day or two after the FreeBSD Foundation published their fundraising letter uh, because normally they do more than 90% of their fundraising in the last couple of weeks of the year. Uh, and in, this was no exception. It was really not that abnormal. Uh, however, the response was uh, they've now broken their record for the number of donors. Uh, I think previously never more than 1,000 people had donated to the project. This year, there were 1,851 separate donors. That's awesome. That's a great sign. Yes. And uh, they also broke their 
goal, uh, which was five hundred thousand dollars for twenty twelve, and the final total for twenty twelve was seven hundred twenty three thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars donated. That's congratulations to the FreeBSD Foundation. Yes, uh, I was uh, quite nice to see that. It feels uh, like twenty twelve was a great year for them. Yes, and also uh, interesting thing is that the top donor this year was an anonymous donor donating over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's very mysterious. You know who that top donor should be is Apple for their you know reliance yeah. on FreeBSD for OS X. Uh, it's it's also interesting because in 2011 the largest donor was only fifty thousand dollars. Only. Yeah. Uh, although uh, NetApp this year donated more than a hundred thousand, uh, and so they set a new level uh, for the top donor until they were beat by this anonymous donor at the last minute. And Scale Engine donated. Yes. Uh, also Netflix, uh, because all their new technology for their own CDN is based right. on... Because uh, uh, that was another thing when people were concerned, you know, they're trying to use the fact that the FreeBSD Foundation hadn't met their 50% of their goal yet as uh, proof that FreeBSD is dying, which is a funny talk at a couple of conferences. Anyway, um, they were... Uh, you know, expecting a fairly large donation from Netflix, but they yeah. weren't sure if, because of you know red tape and so on, that it was going to go through in time to be counted as 2012. Otherwise, it would just be a jump start in 2013. Uh, but you know, it turns out that uh, everything's going quite well. Congrats to them. But and, the, uh, the biggest thing was that the extra publicity meant that there were a lot more individual people donating small amounts of money, uh, which is a, a nice thing to see. Yeah. And uh, the list of everyone who donated is up on the FreeBSD Foundation's website. Do, 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 do. All right, Alan. Well, I think that just about wraps up everything we had for this week, doesn't it? Uh, yep. All right. Just a quick plug. If you want to get some gaming on, go over to jbgame.tv. Check out our Google Plus community over there that Price TX is working on. We also have a new IRC room. I think it's uh, Pound JB Gaming over on irc.geekshed.net. I might be... I might be wrong on that, but uh, it, the, inform the information's over on the uh, Google Plus community page. So if you want to join in and start chatting with people, you can. And uh, just, just to get started, go to jbgame.tv and join the community. We're, uh, we're at the stage... Jupiter Gaming. Jupiter Gaming. Pound Jupiter Gaming for the IRC. Uh, we're at the stage where we're trying to get ideas for maybe future expansion to other community games people might want to get involved at. And there's some roles people could fit in the community if you have an interest in getting involved like that. Or if you just kind of want to get in while the community is just getting informed at the ground floor... Now's the time, so I just want to invite you guys to do that. But Alan, thanks for the... Oh, I should mention, folks who join us live and uh, rock out in our awesome chat room, who's go they're just going all episode long, telling us about stuff, saying crazy things, and uh, you can do that just by joining us over at jblive.tv for the video, or jblive.info for the audio, and do that at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. And uh, we just sit here, and uh, we go, actually, the shows... If you think TechSnap's a big show... You should join us live. It's even longer because we have uh, we have time in between segments where uh, we chat with the chat room. I get up and take a leak, and then Alan's just answering questions, things like that, or vice versa. So I always encourage you guys to join us live. But with that, Alan, thank you for the great show. I think we're gonna have a great 2013. We're now on the track to episode 100, and we got some fun yes. stuff in the works for that. So everybody, stay tuned for that. But Alan, all of that done. That wraps up this week's episode of TechSnap. But we'll be right back here next week.